Okay, so my name is David Silk and I am the learning manager at Newcastle Castle. And what we're going to have a little look at on this tour is some of the surviving remains of medieval Newcastle. We're going to have a wander through some of the old marketplaces, the old churches, um, even some old houses, believe it or not, um, which are still surviving, still standing today from the medieval period. Uh, a lot of people don't even know that Newcastle has a castle. Um, you would hope or think that it would be fairly obvious from the name of the town. Uh, but Newcastle is probably more famous for um, coal and shipbuilding and its industrial history than it is for a lot of the earlier history. But Newcastle has a massive, deep, deep history going all the way back to the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago. Um, and a huge part of that is the medieval history of the town. Um, not very many people know that in the Middle Ages, Newcastle was either the third or fourth richest town or settlement in the whole of England. Um, for most of that time. It was a massively wealthy port. And uh, we start here, um, which is, depending on who you talk to, either the oldest or second oldest church in Newcastle. Now that just comes down to how you count the age of churches. It's probably not the first church ever built in Newcastle, um, but it is the oldest church building still surviving. Um, if you take a look at the, the stonework, it's got quite kind of massive stonework there, and the arches, the rounded arches with the columns, um, are very distinctive of quite an early period of architecture. It gets called Norman um, or Romanesque sometimes because it, it has a bit of a Roman look to it with those kind of columns and pillars. Um, and that is the style of architecture which was around in the 10 and 1100s, so just after the Normans um, had invaded England. Um, the building has, it's fair to say, been knocked around a little bit since then. Um, it actually went through um, a siege in the English Civil War um, and there is, uh, on the other side of the wall, you can see little bits of cannon damage um, on the, uh, the church still. But there are substantial uh, bits of very early um, medieval stonework still remaining. Now, why St Andrew? He's not usually a very popular saint down here in England. He's more popular north of the border. Well, that's where things get kind of interesting in the story of Newcastle in the Middle Ages, because in the middle of the 1100s, Newcastle actually was part of Scotland. And that may well be the time that St Andrew's Church was first constructed. Um, in return for his help um, in a civil war that was going on in England at the time, a period known as the Anarchy in the middle of the 1100s, um, King Stephen of England, um, who was fighting against his cousin, Matilda, the daughter of the previous king, um, for the throne, um, gave the earldom of Northumberland to the King of Scots, King David, um, in return for um, his support and in return for withholding his support from the other side. And uh, he actually used Newcastle along with Carlisle um, as two of his capitals. He really represents, um, I guess, the high point of Scottish ambitions um, to extend their border southwards. Um, and it's probably from this period um, that St Andrew's Church originally dates from. Um, Needless to say, we are in England, so uh, he wasn't permanently successful, but uh, Newcastle eventually fell back into the fold um, of English rule. Um, another interesting little feature of St Andrew's Church, as far as medieval stuff goes, um, is that inside there is a 14th century chantry chapel. Now this is now a, a Church of England church, so you don't really get uh, chantries anymore. But in the Middle Ages, it was common for wealthy people um, to endow or build uh, these little chapels attached to churches and the condition was that they were built so that people would come into the chapel and pray for their soul after death. Um, they believed that that would um, speed their journey into heaven um, after they died. And this one was built um, by a gentleman by the name of Sir Aymer de Athol. Um, Athol, of course, up in Scotland. Um, he was uh, from a Scottish family um, but they ended up on the southern side of the border during the wars between England and Scotland. Um, and he was uh, a loyal knight um, serving the English crown um, in a military career that lasted into his 80s. Um, he died in 1402 um, with his first military commands coming in the 1340s. So there's a huge kind of career of, uh, of around 60 years of military service. Um, his wife had died before him. She was buried in this church and he created a chapel for anyone who would say prayers for her soul. And when he finally died, um, he was buried next to her. And uh, up until the Reformation, there was a beautiful brass tomb cover depicting him at full length in his armour and his wife dressed in her finery 
um, over the top of their tomb in there. Sadly, smashed up uh, during the Reformation when people thought these things were much too Catholic. And uh, nowadays, the only thing that remains is in uh, the Great North Museum, and it is his feet. Um, that's the only thing you can see, his feet resting on what might be a lion or a dog, depending on uh, how you take medieval artwork to look. So we're here at the very northern end of town. Um, St Andrews is the kind of farthest flung of Newcastle's medieval churches. Um, just up that way, um, you, would see the, uh, you would have seen the new gate um, that goes through the walls of the town. That marked the northern edge of Newcastle. Um, the new gate replaced an earlier gate called the Berwick Gate. Um, it was a massive um, fortified gateway, um, later on uh, used as the prison for Newcastle, um, up until it was demolished, sadly, in uh, 1823. Um, and a lot of the town walls were removed around that time to make way for things like um, Eldon Square and um, other kind of aspects of modern town planning, which is why we don't have very much of Newcastle's town walls left. However, the next place that we're going to go and have a little look at are the remaining fragments of Newcastle's town walls, known as the West Walls, um, just by Stowell Street. So if you would like to follow me. stop here because yep. um, you get something of a sense walking past them of um, the kind of immensity of um, the town walls and this is only a very short section of them. Um, now the story goes that sometime in the middle of the 1200s a wealthy merchant from Newcastle was walking the streets of his own hometown um, thinking nothing of it when all of a sudden a group of Scottish raiders uh, descended uh, on the town, grabbed hold of him, stuck him on the back of a horse, rode off back up into Scotland with him and only agreed to release him to his family um, upon the payment of an incredibly hefty uh, ransom of uh, some huge quantity of marks of silver. Um, needless to say, uh, Newcastle by this point was back in the English sphere of influence and having two uh, great kingdoms, England and Scotland, butting up against each other not far from here. Um, made this a less than peaceful place to live. And uh, when this merchant returned to Newcastle, he returned with sort of horror stories of how the, the people of Newcastle and these merchants were not even safe uh, within their own homes um, from Scottish raiders. And a decision was taken by the people that they needed to do something about it. The town needed defending. And uh, they petitioned the king for a right to raise a tax um, to build the wall themselves quite unusual. Usually when you get big construction projects like this, they are undertaken by royalty, people who can chuck, you know, at the time, thousands of pounds um, into projects like this to build them very rapidly. Um, in actual fact, the complete construction of Newcastle's town walls took around about a hundred years to complete. Um, they were begun in around the year 1265, or at least that's the first year the tax was raised to help pay for the, uh, the, the building and the maintenance of the walls. And it finishes um, around about the 1340s, so they seem to be complete by then. Um, and they are actually, we don't chat about it as much as we should in Newcastle, they are one of the most impressive pieces of defensive work anywhere in this country. Um, when they were first standing, they were around 25 feet high. It's about seven metres, um, about six feet thick, so two metres thick. Um, and the complete circuit of the walls takes in just over two miles um, of wall. Not only that, but uh, down here you will see uh, they've dug something of a ditch, um, which is a bit of a modern illusion or uh, a, a kind of reference to the ditch that was there originally. This was known as um, the King's Ditch or the King's Dyke. Um, and that in itself was actually five metres deep um, and about 12 metres wide. So it's an absolutely massive ditch dug in front of the walls to prevent any besieging army from being able to get uh, siege engines, um, rams and siege towers and things like that up to um, the town's walls. And when they were complete, 
Um, certainly by the 1500s, we have a survey of England done by an, an antiquarian uh, called John Leland, working for Henry VIII. And uh, he mentions that the walls of Newcastle far surpass in strength the walls of every town in England and most of the towns of Europe. Um, and around about 100 years later, um, a Scottish writer who is part of an army besieging Newcastle at the time, um, and he is uh, a person who's travelled all over the world, um, he says that the only walls that he can think of anywhere that he has seen that are comparable to these are the walls of Jerusalem or of Constantinople. Um, that is high praise. These are massive, massive fortifications designed to turn the town of Newcastle into a fortress that could withstand a long siege. If you go to a city like York, they have a lot more of their city walls surviving, um, but in terms of height, they're more designed to keep uh, kind of vagabonds from wandering in and out of the town um, at night time more than they are to resist a siege, whereas these are a serious obstacle to an attacking army. And uh, it's around about here, um, just near um, the West Gate, which lay in, in that direction, um, that uh, in 1388, Newcastle found itself besieged by a Scottish army led by the Earl of Douglas. And the defenders inside were led by one of the most famous men of his day, um, Henry Percy, um, better known as Hotspur, um, the son of the Earl of Northumberland. Um, he was called Hotspur for his kind of recklessness in battle. Uh, he had been knighted at the age of 13 um, after leading an army into battle at the Siege of Berwick. Um, and uh, by this point, he was still a young man um, and eager to get to grips with the Scots outside the walls. Siege was far too boring for him. And so he suggested to the leader of the Scottish army, a much older, um, more experienced knight, um, the Earl of Douglas, um, that the two of them, uh, rather than having their armies duke it out in a siege, should fight in single combat outside the walls. And um, rather surprisingly, the Scottish general um, agreed to this, uh, this kind of display. That was the reality of war in the Middle Ages, after all. A lot of it was for show. A lot of it was about honour, especially the honour of the, the commanders. And uh, so uh, soldiers from both sides came out of the gates, um, out to the, the western section of the walls, where they set up a joust. And uh, Percy and Douglas mounted their finest horses with their um, heraldic coats over their armour and uh, hanging down from the sides of their horses and crashed together with their lances. Um, the first round, their lances broke against each other's shield, shattered. Um, if this was the sport of jousting, that would be a reasonable score. That was one of the goals of jousting, to break your spear on your opponent's shield. Um, but they both fetched fresh spears for themselves, clashed again, and this time a great groan went up from the English side um, watching from the walls because Percy uh, was carried backwards off his horse and crashed to the ground. Uh, as for Douglas, Percy's lance, his spear, was broken off in Douglas's shield with um, Percy's pennon, his flag, still hanging from it. And uh, Douglas is supposed to have pulled the spear out uh, and laughed at Percy that his flag would make a fine decoration hanging from the walls of his castle back in Scotland. Um, poor Hotspur was carried back into Newcastle to uh, fume over his, uh, his defeat. And uh, he was even angrier the next morning because he received news. The Scottish raiding parties had returned in the night and uh, the Scots, deciding that they'd got as much loot as they were going to get, um, had decamped and were marching back up to Scotland. Um, not willing to let his flag go, um, Percy um, rallied as many troops as he could from Newcastle and rode out of the West Gate and followed the Scots north. And uh, by nightfall, they had caught up with them near Otterburn, up, up in Northumberland. Um, Percy's famous recklessness got the better of him on this occasion, though. Um, for at Otterburn, um, the Scots were at first surprised that the English had come upon them so close to the evening um, and uh, quickly got themselves dressed for battle. Um, but uh, unfortunately, while Percy and all of his knights had arrived there quite quickly on their fine horses, um, his foot soldiers and his archers, uh, mounted on little ponies, um, were still left some way behind um, and had some catching up to do. And uh, the Scots were able to turn things around and uh, the Battle of Otterburn became a bit of a rout for the English. Eventually, uh, Sir Ralph Percy, Hotspur's brother, uh, was captured. Uh, he surrendered to a Scottish knight when he realised that his boots were full of his own blood um, as he was battling away. And uh, Hotspur himself was surrounded and uh, said that he would only surrender to Douglas himself. Um, and he was carried to um, a small 
patch of gorse bushes which lay in the midst of the battlefield. And there he was shown the body of the Earl of Douglas, who, uh, despite winning the battle, um, had been killed at the height of it. His squire hadn't put his helmet on properly. Um, it had fallen off in the midst of the battle um, and he had been struck a killing blow. And uh, Percy is said to have surrendered his sword to his dead enemy. Um, before being carried off up into Scotland as a prisoner. Um, so that just gives you a bit of a taste of um, some of the kind of warfare um, and siege that these, uh, these towers have undergone. Um, and you can still see there are, there's obviously restored stonework on the outside, but you can still see the remains of the defensive features, the arrow loops um, and uh, what are called um, usually uh, merlons um, on the top, these kind of raised um, stone sections that soldiers could, uh, could hide behind for their own defence. Um, there are even, um, if you take a look, the little uh, holes along the edge there probably reflect where there used to be some kind of wooden covering. Um, these are called hoardings and they were, they were built on top of the walls, um, like little wooden houses almost. Um, but they could be used to shelter the soldiers and allow them to stand um, above enemies who were uh, trying to undermine the wall and drop hot water or rocks or things like that on top of their heads while they were trying to uh, dig underneath um, the town walls. Most of the walls were sadly taken down in the 1800s. Um, they were becoming quite ruinous by then anyway. Um, and a large portion of them were actually destroyed um, in the 1600s, in 1644. Um, that became the first time that Newcastle ever fell to siege. Um, a Scots army in uh, the English Civil Wars um, was able to undermine the walls with the help of miners from Elswick, um, plant gunpowder underneath the foundations and actually blow up whole sections of the wall. Um, and storm the town that way. Um, but until the invention of gunpowder, these seem to have been pretty impregnable um, and withstood many a siege, many a battle in their day. Um, so we're going to go and have a little look next at a uh, slightly less uh, violent or uh, martial aspect of uh, Newcastle's medieval history, because just behind the walls here um, is one of the surviving religious houses um, of Newcastle, a little bit distinct from uh, the churches. Um, although that's not what it's used for today, but uh, we'll take a wander in this direction. And here we are. So they're doing a little bit of work um, on the inside at the moment. They're actually uh, building a microbrewery here, believe it or not. Um, but this building here um, is part of the remains of uh, Blackfriars in Newcastle. Now, um, these friaries or priories um, were religious houses, a little bit like monasteries, and uh, they were a major feature of medieval life in Newcastle. So there were four parish churches. These were the ordinary churches with priests where um, the, the citizens of the town um, would go to worship. But there were also a number of these religious houses. There were the Black Friars, or the Dominicans, um, the White Friars, um, or, Franc uh, 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 or Carmelites, the Grey Friars, or the Franciscans, and uh, St. Bartholomew's Nunnery, and later on, uh, the Austin Friars, who are uh, a uniquely English um, order of friars. Now, the closest most people know to a friar, I think, is probably Friar Tuck, um, Robin Hood's, uh, you know, uh, girthy companion. And uh, I think most people will get very confused between friars and monks. The basic difference is you won't really find monks in great numbers in towns or cities. Monasteries are usually built out in the countryside. Monks wanted solitude. They wanted to cut themselves off from the world and stay in their monasteries and pray. Um, the point of a friar is quite different. Friars were supposed to go out among the ordinary people um, and preach to them and provide them with all kinds of religious services. So these were often built in towns and cities. Now the friars themselves took all kinds of vows to live a religious life. They wore um, quite austere um, habits, these kind of uniform robes that they wore. The black friars um, actually wore white robes, confusingly, um, but with black hoods and cloaks over the top of them. Um, which would have given them quite a distinctive look. In fact, some people even believe that uh, the reason that Newcastle United play in black and white um, has something to do uh, with the Black Friars, um, who later on were based out in the east end um, of the city. 
But uh, in the Middle Ages, from about 1239 onwards, that's when this was founded, some of the merchants of Newcastle uh, gave money in their wills to the Dominican order to build their friary here. And uh, they built this quite magnificent um, structure here, which uh, had a church, um, a banqueting hall, um, things like an infirmary and hospital, um, all of these kind of buildings where the, the friars could provide their services to the people of Newcastle. Um, these were some of the most learned um, people of their day as well, um, friars, particularly Franciscan friars, but also um, black friars such as the people here, um, were often famous kind of scholars, philosophers um, and scientists um, in, the term, in the way that people understood that in the medieval period. Um, this was also the place where the kings of England often used to come. Now, the kings, of course, had their own castle in Newcastle. But you see, the thing with castles is um, they're not always terribly comfortable places to have to stay or live. They are, after all, fortresses designed to resist um, a siege. Once the town walls had been completed, or almost completed, um, the kings preferred slightly more comfortable surroundings, and the Black Friars were able to supply that, um, for a price, of course. Um, the, the order itself quickly became very, very wealthy um, and powerful. And uh, when the King of England in the 1330s was uh, plotting uh, once again how he was going to conquer Scotland um, and bring that within his, uh, his sphere of influence, um, he received um, a, a candidate for the Scottish throne, a man called Edward Balliol, um, here in Blackfriars in Newcastle, um, and uh, received his oath of service to him. He swore that if the King of England would put him on the throne of Scotland, that he would become his loyal um, servant. Um, sadly, it was not to be. Um, Edward Balliol's uh, mission, he was uh, King of Scotland for a few weeks, um, but apparently was caught unawares by uh, a Scots army shortly afterwards and had to flee naked uh, back into England. He didn't even have time to pull his pants and hose on before uh, he was forced uh, to flee from Scotland. Um, but that was right here um, in the buildings inside here that uh, that, that all took place. Um, you can also see um, in some places around here you can see various kind of plaques and coats of arms and things up on the wall. Um, after the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII, um, these buildings were all sold off and they were sold to the guilds in Newcastle, the, the trade guilds, um, who controlled the various um, the various kind of different categories of workers and things within the, within the city. And uh, these became their guild halls. It's what they were used for throughout the 15, 16, um, into the 1700s um, in many cases. These were kind of guild meeting places. Nowadays though, um, you can in fact uh, still eat in the old refectory of the, the, the friars in here because uh, it is now a beautiful restaurant. Um, and uh, they've uh, restored and maintained uh, the banqueting hall, which was the place where um, royalty would have met and been entertained. And uh, you can actually hire it out for your very own medieval banquets, um, or you can just get some of the finest kind of local produce and things. Um, fantastic um, surroundings of a medieval priory in there. So, um, wonderful little asset to have for, uh, for a city like Newcastle, really. Now, uh, we're going to move on now, and uh, we're going to head down to the old... Uh, commercial centre of Newcastle, I suppose, from back in the day, um, which uh, is nowadays known for something quite different, um, but is nonetheless still one of the most famous bits of Newcastle, the people from outside the city. Um, but we're going to pop um, along here and uh, we're, we're going to head out and uh, into the town's markets. But not far from here, this is the site of uh, what was called the White Cross. So there used to be um, a large medieval stone cross, um, probably painted white, hence its name, um, which marked the entrance to the town's original marketplaces. These were kind of traditional centres for, um, for markets. Um, people would gather around these crosses um, and, uh, and trade. That was the earliest places that people set up their market stalls and things. Um, if you want to see an original one of these, uh, Annick, the town centre in Annick, actually still has its original uh, medieval market cross. Um, sadly, none of them are left in, uh, in Newcastle. But they are remembered, these markets, in the names of the streets around here. So where we're going to have a little walk down through, 
um, is the big market. Um, at one time, this whole street all the way down through the big market would have been absolutely packed with uh, market stalls, particularly on um, a weekend. Um, so they held large weekly markets. Um, but these were where the, the various traders of the town, the sort of butchers, cloth merchants, um, and things like that would come to sell their wares in the town. So there would have been stalls lining both sides of the street. It would have been quite a bustling, quite a busy place. And on market days, and on the two um, fairs that were held every year, um, in uh, August and around November, um, it would have got even busier. You would have seen trade coming in from all over the north of England. Um, people would have come to the fair in Newcastle to um, trade animals and things like that, livestock um, and what have you, as well as to be uh, entertained in uh, the ways that you only can in the big city, as it were. So uh, we'll head down this way into the big market. So this is, uh, is the city's big market. This is probably most famous as like, it's like the stag do district from like a few years back. Um, but uh, this once was like the main, the, the names remember that these were once the main markets of medieval Newcastle. Um, big, people often wonder what, what does that mean? Why have they spelt big wrong? Well, they haven't. It's not that it's a large market. Um, big is what they sold in this part of the marketplace basically. So big is a type of um, barley, um, or grain that was grown up here in the north of Britain. It was kind of what everyone made their bread and things like that out of. You've got the cloth market, um, the flesh market, um, and other places like that as well. The groat market where oats were sold, flesh market fairly obviously where the meat was, and uh, cloth where the woolen cloth was sold. So that's basically what all medieval clothes were made out of. And wool was Newcastle's main export. Before coal, this was the place that Northumberland wool was shipped out of England um, and down into the low countries um, to merchants. They call these people Flemings um, in, uh, in medieval times, medieval England. And there's actually quite a large community of uh, Flemish merchants. So these would be people we would term Dutch or Belgian probably nowadays, um, living in Newcastle, as well as lots of Italians, which might surprise people. Um, but there were a large number of merchants from uh, a city called Lucca um, in Italy, also living in Newcastle. And a little bit later on, Newcastle began to trade with the Baltic as well. That's where most of the timber to build this town actually came from, it was from places like Estonia and Latvia and Finland. Um, and uh, the people from there, they termed Easterlings. So all of the people who came from sort of the north coast of Germany, all the way into the Baltic Sea were Easterlings. Um, and there were large communities of them living in medieval Newcastle as well. So this idea that uh, medieval England was somewhere that people never travelled or knew nothing more than a few miles outside their own homes um, is simply not true. Um, Newcastle was a major trading port and as such the people here would have been very used to um, all sorts of different languages and people of different uh, cultures and customs than their own. And of course all these people were bringing things into the, the town as well. Um, the richer merchants would have worn silk clothing um, and we know from uh, trade records, especially from the taxes that were raised on different trade goods uh, to pay for the town wall, uh, that they were also bringing in things like sugar, almonds, um, raisins, figs, uh, cumin, cinnamon, um, black pepper, um, all kinds of things that were relatively exotic um, to most people um, in England, at least in rural England um, in those days. But in the towns like Newcastle, um, in these markets, um, you would have been able to get all kinds of, uh, of foreign goods that, uh, that would, would have given uh, the merchants um, a kind of slightly more cosmopolitan diet um, than most of the people were able to have at the time. Um, we know from medieval recipes things like ginger, saffron um, were very very popular flavours. They liked spiced um, food um, and it's in these markets that all these things would have been sold um, and on market days you would have also seen all kinds of uh, classic medieval entertainment, jugglers, fire eaters, conjurers, um, traveling musicians, dancing bears, um, all that kind of stuff would have been coming into the town. Um, and you can imagine this place would have been pretty chaotic. Um, and of course, going alongside markets anywhere, you would also get a lot of ale houses and a lot of ale being sold. So, you know, having said it's very different, 
um, maybe the big market hasn't actually changed um, all that much from medieval times. Though it would be nice to see a few more market stalls in here every now and again. But uh, we're going to have a wander down now um, past St Nicholas Church, which is um, the Cathedral of Newcastle nowadays, um, the largest medieval church, and then down onto the quayside. So uh, we'll head this way. Here we are. So this is St Nicholas Church, or uh, Newcastle Cathedral, um, if you prefer. Um, it's one of two cathedrals in Newcastle, or three, um, depending on how you count them, but uh, this is the um, Anglican Church of England um, Cathedral. Um, when it was built though, this was one of, uh, this was Newcastle's largest um, of its four parish churches. And I was talking earlier about uh, that there are some disagreements on how you count which is the oldest church um, in, uh, in a town. Now, St. Nicholas Church, in one form or another, has been here since about the year 1090. So within 10 years of the building of the first castle in Newcastle, so the very earliest um, part of the town. Sadly, however, uh, that building, um, St. Nicholas Church, burned down in a huge fire in the year 1216 and had to be completely rebuilt. So the building that you're looking at here um, is substantially um, from the 14th century um, and added to over the years. Um, particularly impressive though, the tower here, um, known as the Lantern Tower, um, comes from the, the very end of the 15th century, around 1485, the very end of the medieval period in England. Um, it was paid for um, not by a king um, or a knight or a noble lord, um, but by a lawyer and a merchant from Newcastle upon Tyne by the name of Robert Rhodes. And this gives you an idea of just how powerful and how rich um, these people were starting to become. They were really a kind of rising um, middle class almost, if you like, in medieval England. You know, there were the peasants at the bottom, um, there were the knights and the nobles up at the top. Um, but then in between you had this kind of merchant class who were rapidly making themselves um, very, very powerful, very wealthy. Um, and they wanted to, to stamp a uh, sign of that wealth on the town that they lived in. And uh, that tower is probably one of the, the finest examples of late medieval English architecture that you're going to find um, anywhere in the north of England. It's actually, I believe, copied for um, a later uh, bit of uh, Durham Cathedral, some of the Durham Cathedral buildings um, a little bit later on. Very fantastic uh, thing. It's called the Lantern Tower because at one time it did actually have a lantern in it. Um, you'll notice that it's hollow on top. Um, it had a lantern hanging in there and burning um, at night time and uh, that served as a kind of lighthouse to guide merchant ships that were coming up the river so that they would know that they were arriving in Newcastle. Um, St Nicholas, um, probably more famous today as uh, Santa Claus, um, is uh, actually the patron saint not only of children but also of merchants and sailors, um, both very very important uh, to Newcastle and to the, uh, the global kind of Europe-wide trade certainly that Newcastle was engaged in. So he was a very appropriate um, patron saint for the town and this was the most powerful and important of its parish churches. So it was natural when Newcastle was finally granted city status in the 1880s by Queen Victoria, whose statue is just over there, um, this was chosen to be Newcastle's cathedral and the seat of Newcastle's bishop. Um, so it's unusual in English cathedrals in that it's not originally a cathedral, it was never built to be one. Um, it is a local church, um, but it has been kind of made a little bit more grand. Um, but it's still on a, a kind of different scale to things like Durham Cathedral. Um, it, so now we're going to walk down kind of past the castle really. So we're going uh, through to the very start of uh, Newcastle's story in uh, 1080 when the first new castle was actually built here on the banks of the Tyne and we're going to drop down onto the quayside um, and uh, we're going to see a couple of the remaining medieval buildings on the quayside before we swing back up to the castle. So uh, we'll head this way now. 
looks like I'm taking you down a dodgy back alley here. Um, but we're going down to the long stairs, um, which is one of the big staircases along with the dog leap stairs and the castle stairs um, that leads down the side of what's called the castle hoof or hill um, and down onto the quayside on the River Tyne. It's easy to forget nowadays, but Newcastle, there is this big rocky um, outcrop overlooking the River Tyne and uh, that's really the reason that it's here at all. So uh, the castle was built on the site of the Roman fort and when the Romans built the fort here, um, it was to guard the river crossing, which was down um, on the quayside. So Newcastle has for a long, long time been the first place along the River Tyne where you could bridge the river and where you could cross. And that also meant in the days before uh, bridges opened or swiveled or anything like that, it was as far up as you could take um, a ship which meant that the ships had coming up the river had to unload on Newcastle's quayside. That was really what made um, the town so powerful as a trading port. Um, you could come all the way inland to Newcastle, but no further. All right, so here we are on the quayside. Um, have some rather spectacular uh, place names down here. Javel Group um, being one of my favourite. Um, it, it probably means something like uh, the, the jail's drain. Um, and of course all the water from the old jail in the castle uh, used to drain down here and into the Tyne. The river came out all the way up here. This was right on the riverfront um, back in medieval times. A lot of this land has been reclaimed since then. The river is considerably narrower now than it used to be. And uh, behind us here, um, swathed in scaffolding at the moment um, uh, for what is hopefully some repair work going on to it from its owners um, is Newcastle's oldest house. So this is uh, the building known as uh, either uh, the Cooperage or 32 The Close um, and uh, it is a merchant's house dating back to the early 1400s. Um, now if you're in a city like York or somewhere like that you'll see lots and lots of these types of buildings. They represent the standard uh, medieval English method of construction. It's called half timbered. Um, so you've got the dark wood um, and then the, the white, that black and white sort of appearance. People often think of them as Tudor, um, but they go back all the way into the medieval times. And the merchants would have um, their kind of shops on the ground floor so they could sell things to people coming in uh, off the boats. And their living quarters would be um, in the rooms higher up. In fact, the higher up you got, the less important you were generally. Often the servants were um, lived in the attics um, of these buildings, or even the attic spaces were sometimes used um, as warehouses as well. Um, so at one time, Newcastle's quayside would have been lined with these fantastic um, timber buildings, um, which nowadays have this kind of lopsided look to them. The, the wood has settled and twisted over the years. Um, and it makes the, uh, the buildings as a whole look a little bit uh, ramshackle. But these would have been the houses of the very, very wealthy um, back in the Middle Ages. Um, this is known as the Cooperage because in, uh, in the 1800s into the 1950s, um, it was a barrel maker's workshop, so an actual Cooperage. Um, and it was then a pub until about 2010 um, when it was forced to close. I think there were noise complaints, the bands and things playing in there quite regularly. Um, but this is uh, the last remnant of Newcastle's medieval housing. Um, it is very sadly now on um, Historic England's uh, Heritage at Risk Register. Um, it's owned by uh, a company based in Newcastle, but they haven't really done anything with the building um, for a number of years, uh, which means that sadly it has fallen into disrepair somewhat. And uh, Historic England are really pushing hard to try and get the building repaired and put back into use. Um, which would be a fantastic thing to see because I think uh, this is like a little, doesn't look like much at the moment, but it's a little jewel in Newcastle's uh, medieval crown that we should, uh, should cling on to. We're going to carry on down the quayside now and uh, sort of over behind me there, um, you can just see the swing bridge. Um, that is the site of the old medieval Tyne Bridge. So uh, that lasted up until the 1770s um, when it was destroyed in what was known as the Great Flood. Um, but at one time that was a, a stone bridge, an arched stone bridge, um, with much like old London Bridge, with houses built all the way along and up the sides of it. It had towers um, at either end and in the middle, um, with gatehouses and portcullises uh, to stop enemies from crossing and bypassing the town walls. Um, and as I say, it was layered with houses and shops 
that were sadly all swept away um, in the flood of 1771, but very similar style of buildings to, um, to the cooperage. Um, so we'll carry on um, down the quayside now. We're going to go past the Guild Hall, um, where the, the merchants, the powerful merchants and the mayors of Newcastle um, would have met to decide uh, what was going on in the town and uh, on bylaws and taxes and things like that. Um, that is now the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, and we're going to go down onto the quayside itself to have a look at another lovely surviving medieval building. So this is the Guildhall. Um, the building as we see it is largely, it was fronted by um, John Dobson in the 1800s and the building behind largely dates back to the 1600s. Um, but it is on the site of the medieval Guildhall, which has been on this site um, since around about the year 1215. That's when uh, King John first gave uh, the charter, um, an official royal document, uh, to the people of Newcastle, allowing them to form guilds uh, and to elect their own mayor and decide their own affairs to some extent in return for uh, tax payments directly to the king, of course. Now, guilds, very important to medieval life in a town. Um, their organisation something like a trade union. Um, it's probably the closest modern equivalent. Um, but each trade or craft had its own guild. So in Newcastle, there was a cloth merchant's guild, a grain merchant's guild, a shoemaker's guild, a saddler's guild, a glover's guild, a blacksmith's guild, a plumber's guild, and so on. So everyone with their trade would be organised into these guilds. They controlled uh, what prices you could charge for your services. Um, so they, there was an element of kind of uh, protectionism in there as well. Um, but they also did things like um, look after the widows of members of the guild. So if you died um, as a, a merchant, they would look after your widow and your children and things like that. Um, as well as uh, they held processions throughout the town throughout the year. Um, and performed what were known as mystery plays. Um, so we know the Shipbuilders Guild in Newcastle uh, used to perform uh, a play based around Noah's Ark um, in the town um, every year. And each of the guilds would have one of these uh, Bible stories that they sort of acted out. Um, it makes them sound very solemn. They really weren't. These were kind of quite riotous occasions. Um, people dressed in all kinds of weird and wonderful costumes, dressed as God, the devil, um, and all of the associated kind of biblical characters um, and they were almost a little bit like um, kind of comedy plays we were, I, I, I guess sort of slapstick almost in some cases this is the site certainly of the guild hall where they met and uh, just to one side just here roughly where the road is um, was a building called the the Maison Dieu the house of God um, that was built by Newcastle's most powerful merchant um, Roger Thornton um, in around about the 1400s and it was built uh, to look after um, 12 poor people in the town who could not work um, through reason of sickness or, or, or whatever reason they may have. Um, and he gave provision that they could be fed, clothed and housed um, in, in this place. And in return, of course, he expected people to pray for his soul. Um, it's a continuing theme in the Middle Ages. Um, being a merchant, of course, meant you got up to all sorts of dodgy goings on um, and therefore uh, you were worried about the condition of your immortal soul in the afterlife. So you made provision for charity in your will. Um, Thornton, um, we're about to walk up to the street where his house was, um, broad chair. Um, he's said to have come into Newcastle with nothing but a lamb's skin and three halfpennies um, at uh, some point in the late 1300s, but became the wealthiest of Newcastle's merchants. Um, he was mayor of the town, I think, three times and MP for Newcastle um, in the King's Parliament um, around about five times. Um, he's quite a strident figure. Um, he actually uh, opposed Hotspur and his father's rebellion against King Henry IV um, and was greatly rewarded because of that. Um, in fact, it was down to him that Newcastle was eventually separated from the county of Northumberland and made a county in its own right, um, able to elect uh, its own sheriffs, tax collectors, maintain its own prisons and things like that. Um, and it's still known properly as the town and county of Newcastle upon Tyne to this day. And that's all thanks to Roger Thornton, um, whose uh, memorial is up in 
uh, the cathedral up in St Nicholas Church, if people want to go and have a look at it. It is the largest medieval brass funeral memorial anywhere in Britain, um, which again gives an idea of how wealthy uh, these merchants in Newcastle really were. Um, so we'll have a little walk along now to the broad chair. Here we are. So this is, uh, is Trinity House, and this is another one of those little um, medieval remains that are just sort of hidden in amongst uh, the middle of the very modern uh, quayside. You've got the big court building there, Tesco's Express, and uh, then you've got this beautiful uh, 15th century townhouse. Bits of it have been restored through the 1800s, but this is, um, was once one of the homes of one of Newcastle's merchants, again. So this is the street, this street broad chair, is where Roger Thornton lived. And uh, in this house, uh, a merchant named Ralph Hebben, um, presumably originally his family or, or he were actually from Hebben in South Tyneside, um, lived here. And uh, when he died, he actually donated it to one of the guilds. And this became the uh, base, I suppose, base of operations of the guild known as Trinity House, who were the Guild of Mariners. So these are sailors, ships captains and masters, um, as they would have been called back in medieval times. And uh, they held it from the descendants of Ralph Hebben. They didn't actually ever um, own it technically. They rented it and they paid rent of a single rose, a single red rose every year on Midsummer's Day um, to Ralph Hebben's descendants. And this is still carried out, this little ritual, because this is still where Trinity House is based today. Now, they're not quite as powerful as they used to be. Um, Trinity House, at one time the Guild of Mariners of Newcastle, actually controlled all shipping between Berwick-upon-Tweed and Whitby um, along the north coast. So the whole of the North Sea coast, um, they trained the pilots who guided merchant ships into the rivers and um, into the harbours and things um, all the way along there, as well as, well as maintaining all of the lighthouses um, and the, the, the buoys and things like that out to sea. Um, nowadays, um, they're more of a kind of charitable organisation, although they are still one of only three organisations in the UK who are licensed to examine deep sea pilots. It's one of the things I love about this country, really, is that we do combine that kind of uh, modern uh, with ancient traditions um, very effortlessly, really, a lot of the time. Um, but uh, it's a beautiful surviving um, medieval building, rarely open these days, to the public at least. Um, but if you get a chance on something like um, Heritage Open Days in September, um, they do sometimes do tours. Um, so do get yourself in um, and have a little look around. Um, just up on top of the hill here, where we're going to head now, um, is uh, All Saints Church. That is not medieval, so uh, we're not terribly interested in the building itself. Um, but it stands on the site of a, a medieval church, All Hallows, um, that used to be there. Um, that was pulled down in the 1700s. It was becoming rather dangerous. Um, and so uh, they blew it up with gunpowder. Um, in the way of things in the 1700s, crushed a poor man while they were uh, doing the repair work as well. But uh, that's health and safety in the 1700s for you, really. So we're going to head up this way along uh, what's called Dog Bank. Um, it used to be called Silver Street. Um, in the 1100s, that was where Newcastle's Jewish community used to live. So again, quite early on, um, Jewish communities seem to have started arriving in England with the Normans in about 1066. And by the 1100s, they were established in Newcastle and seemed to have had uh, business as silversmiths, so making kind of silverware and um, plates and things like that for the very wealthy. Um, sadly, the story of uh, medieval Jews in England is not a very happy one. Um, they were expelled from Newcastle in the 1230s on the request of the townspeople. Um, and about a generation later, in 1290, King Edward I actually expelled all of England's Jews um, over to Europe, and they didn't return until after the Civil War. Um, so it really is a quite a nasty history of uh, sort of anti-Semitism for much of um, medieval Europe, really. Um, but we'll carry on along Silver Street. We're going to go down Aikenside Bank and up the side to the castle. <laughs> 
So this is uh, Akenside Hill, used to be known as Butcher's Bank. This is where the butchers of Newcastle were based. Uh, and there was a small stream called the Lorch Burn that flowed into the Tyne near here. And the reason the butchers were based here is that all the offal and the things that they couldn't sell, the bones, the blood, um, was basically chucked into that little river um, and flowed down into the Tyne became something of an open sewer going through the town. Um, whenever we talk about grand buildings in uh, medieval towns, it is worth bearing in mind that there is also a rather nastier, smellier side to medieval cities, which is that uh, they didn't always have a very clear idea of things like sanitation and uh, how to keep their uh, cities clean and tidy. They tried their best. I mean, there were ordinances to stop people flinging stuff into the streets, and uh, the town corporation, the, the merchants altogether, um, did employ people um, variously in later periods called gong farmers um, or night soil men uh, to travel around the town collecting up people's waste that had been thrown out of their houses. Remember, this is the days before flushing toilets. Um, and uh, pile it into great big heaps, uh, which were known as middens. And if you grew up in the northeast, you may well have heard. Uh, people's parents referring to kids' bedrooms as middens when they get them messy. Well, that's what a midden is. It is a great pile of, not to put it too delicately, crap. So we've got one last little climb ahead of us, um, but we're here at the foot of what is variously called the side um, or sometimes just side, depending on who you talk to. There's a lot of argument over what the street name should be. Um, but this steep hill that curves round is right on the, the, the edge of the Castle Huff. So the hill on the side of the castle. And at one time it was crammed with the houses of some of the wealthier people of medieval Newcastle. Um, sadly, most of that, certainly on this side, was destroyed um, in a big fire in the 1800s, um, which led to the building of uh, Milburn House there. Um, in about 1905 and um, so there's very little left of all of that but certainly this is where some of the wealthier houses of people in Newcastle would have been found and uh, once we've staggered up to the top of the hill um, we will find ourselves at the castle uh, where the story uh, all begins really. Uh, off we go. There we go, looking to your left there, you can see uh, the black gate, the drum towers of the old gatehouse of the castle. And as we go up the hill on the other side of the railway line, you'll be able to see the castle keep, the old sort of central tower um, of the castle. And remember those Franciscan friars I was talking about earlier? Here is uh, Brother Stuart to greet us at the gatehouse of the castle. But here we are at the Black Gate, and this is where it all began. This is the new castle that gave the town um, its name. Originally a wooden castle built in about 1080 by the son of William the Conqueror, um, Robert Curthose. It was rebuilt on the orders of Henry II about 100 years later by his master mason, Maurice the Engineer, um, who also did a lot of work on Dover Castle. Um, built to a very similar plan to Newcastle. He built the great keep here. Um, the Black Gate itself was added a little bit later. Um, we know that the person in charge of the castle then was a man by the name of Sir William Heron, um, whose name has gone down in infamy in, uh, in Newcastle. He is the original evil sheriff. Um, but he oversaw construction of uh, not only the Black Gate, but also the prison, the Heron Pit, um, just behind it that bears his name. Uh, where he used to throw people who had upset him in some way until their families could pay huge ransoms to have them released. Um, but as for the castle, um, you will have to come in and explore that yourselves. Um, but that is just a little uh, taste of uh, medieval Newcastle for you. Um, very, very rich um, history stretching back, um, really right the way back into the 11th century um, for, for medieval Newcastle and earlier, back to Hadrian's Wall and the Romans. Um, and it's wonderful that we've still got so many remains of it still around the town that you can still see as you're walking around um, packed up next to all of the modern buildings and what have you. So uh, thank you very much.